question on everybody's lips here is how long will the rally continue for? Snow is obviously going to be a problem as it continues to fall, not only in the moors, but also here in Bradford. It is a great shame, in fact, because for many years the championship has never seen such a competitive field. In previous years, we've had two or three four-wheel drive cars. Here, the top ten is dominated by four-wheel drive cars. Uh, you know, it doesn't look so good when it's snowing so much, and uh, uh, I think uh, to be uh, as a number one car on the road, uh, it will be quite a hard job. To drive. This car that you're using is obviously going to be better suited to the conditions of the S1. Yes, yeah, you know, I should prefer S1 because there we have got the power split and I can get the car sideways much easier and control it for much easier. You know, this car uh, intends to understeer more and uh, more slippery it is, more difficult it will be. So, uh, so I should prefer to drive S1 car here, yes. I, we're really up against it, not only on the loose rallies, but also the tarmac rallies as well. I mean, the Mantra has been a tremendous car and incredibly reliable, but you can't just keep winning ad infinitum just on the basis of reliability. Um, you never know, it might happen again, but I think it's a very long shot. But you've got to realise these four-wheel drive cars not only have better traction, but most of them are in the region of 400 horsepower now, which is more than 100 horsepower, more than us. When are we likely to see the four-wheel drive car here on the British Championship? Well, the problem is that it's being built to the Group S regulations, and the Group S regulations don't come into force until 1988. So um, it won't be eligible for international competitions uh, during 86 or 87. Uh, we'll be able to compete on perhaps a number of events which are not rounds of FISA championships, something like the Ulster uh, or the Welsh. Um, but otherwise, we'll be doing uh, British national rallies, and we may do one or two special events abroad. We're really lucky the cars here because three weeks ago it was a body shell so you know, David Richards has he's done a very good job to get the car ready but it's very much going to be a new ball game to me and this ice and snow I'm not particularly looking forward to it. I think the thing is which a lot of people don't realise is whilst four wheel drive cars go forward very very quickly there's the same problems when you decide to try and stop them. Yes and the big problem is getting them around the corners at the speed they accelerate at. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult, you know, for the first, uh, for this event. The Citroen stages went very well, indeed. Um, we only ran his course car, and I think we would have been over three minutes ahead. So, it was quite satisfying. So, on this event, are you going to go softly, softly initially? Yeah, yeah. I think everybody is, though. So, um, I think everybody's aiming to be last or something. You must be encouraged by Ford's fantastic result in Sweden. Yeah, that was very good, indeed. Grundle came home with third and everybody, it's made everybody a bit more sort of confident and given them something to smile about and something to go for. It's very difficult. It depends what the four-wheel drive cars do. We don't know how much snow there is on the stages at the moment. I think the tyre choice is going to be very crucial. But I feel that the car can be very quick. So you feel you will be competitive with Auricola? Oh well, this has been a, you know, it's behind me this time. It's the first time it started behind me, but we were beating him on the RAC, so I'm quite sure I'll have a go at him here. Too. Ah, well, I come from Finland, so people say that I should be used to the uh, snow and ice driving, but uh, in Finland we have sturdy tires, which gives uh, quite a lot of grip, and uh, it's, um, it's not so slippery, not so dangerous, but uh, without sturdy tires, it's, uh, it's a lottery. But also, it must be a bigger lottery for the Group B car. Well, I don't think it is, um, uh, I think uh, I think the Group B cars should still win because of, uh, they can get some more power and uh, some of, of course, are four-wheel drive cars, which is a four-wheel drive car you really need in these conditions. But of course, we, we have a front-wheel drive car, which is engine is in the top of uh, front wheels, which gives us a little bit better traction than some other cars, which has got a rear-wheel drive car, but the engine in front. So in that sense, we are in a better. Last September, the climax of the Open Championship and the Mantas were dominating. They were victorious on all the tarmac rallies and heading for another one too here on the Isle of Man. And this was a final round that also highlighted the rivalry between Russell Brooks and Jimmy McRae. Brooks overhauling McRae in the closing stages to take the 1985 Open title. <laughs> Five months since Russell Brooks took that title and how the scene has changed. After the sunshine and tarmac of the Isle of Man, 
These are the snow-covered North Yorkshire Moors, venue for the National Breakdown Rally, round one of the 1986 Shell Oils British Open Championship. Forest stages, sheet ice covered in deep snow, a really supreme test for the drivers, and a virtually impossible task for the organisers as well. And the lineups have changed quite considerably. After the Manta domination of 1985, we've now got the four-wheel drive supercars and some superstar drivers. None greater than the man who won the World Rally Championship in 1983 and the British Open in 1978, Finland's Hannu Mikkola, challenging for the title again, driving for the Audi Sport UK team. His car, the powerful Quattro Sport. And everyone at the start at Bradford was saying Mikola would really relish the conditions. I don't think it will suit anybody because you don't really see under the snow if it's icy or not, and it will be very, very difficult. There was a big change for the man in the Manta who'd come so close to taking the championship last year. Scotland's Jimmy McRae was challenging for his fourth title, but for him, a radical change of machinery. The MG Metro 6R4 would give him four-wheel drive and 400 horsepower, but it was speed and potential that really needed to be handled with care. It's a new team, it's a new car, it's a new ball game for me, so I think we'll just take it very easy and, and find our feet. The new championship was also giving a great opportunity to some of British rallying's brightest potential. 26-year-old David Llewellyn, a one-time farmer from West Wales, was national champion in 1984 and a solid performer in the Quattro last season. For him, also a 6R4 to show whether talent and enthusiasm could be a match for the experience of Mikola. And was such an experienced man. I think that you know he could he could drive a wheelbarrow quickly. Uh, you know, uh, that that's the, that's what I'm up against is the experience. It was the car that won the 1985 World Rally Championship, the four-wheel drive Peugeot 205. Once again, it was in the hands of Finland's Michael Sundström, 27 years old. Sundström has a reputation for being very fast indeed. Speed not always matched by 100% concentration. His car had been rebuilt after crashing out of the RAC rally when Sundström was lying an impressive fourth. The team have stayed loyal to the great talent that Sundström has shown, but are now looking for results instead of repair bills. And there was more British potential in the shape of the reigning national champion Mark Lovell, who drove an Escort Turbo in last year's Open Championship. Lovell, 26 years old, has got experience of a whole range of cars, but his drive for 1986 is the most exciting yet. The Ford RS200, the car we saw take third place on its debut on the Swedish Rally, and a great contrast to anything that Lovell's driven before. The performance of the car is probably three times better than what I've driven before, but we won't be able to use it properly this weekend, so it won't be too much different from struggling around last year. But some things never change. Reigning Open champion Russell Brooks back with the Manta. But even Brooks has his eyes firmly on four-wheel drive, a priority for the season being to develop Vauxhall Opel's new Cadet 4S. In the meantime, it's the two-wheel drive Manta, a car in which he took second place on last year's rally, but no advantages this year. Obviously, we've got a terrible disadvantage. We're only two-wheel drive, and uh, I think we may have a jump to even stay ahead of some of the front-wheel drive cars. The first three stages, starting late at night in the snow and ice, graphically showed where the advantages lay. This is four-wheel drive in the hands of Hannu Mikkola. Now rear-wheel drive, Russell Brooks. Wheel drive, Andrew Wood in the Astra GTE. So the rally underway in the bleakest of conditions. It's now the small hours of Saturday morning, the first service area high above Sutton Bank. And the service crews are waiting rather tensely here to see what kind of trouble their drivers have hit in the first serious snowy forest stage. To get the trouble out on the stages, Russell Brooks was even struggling with the Manta in the confines of the service area.
Russell, even parking the thing is hard enough. Are your worst fears confirmed? Yes. Uh, I mean, absolutely impossible conditions for a conventional car like this. Uh, I mean, I think even the front-wheel drive cars are doing better because they've got the uh, engine over the driven wheels. Uh, we're something like two or three minutes down already in three stages. What have been your worst moments? Um, no hairy moments as such, uh, although the spectators did rush out to push us up a hill in Harwood. Uh, fortunately, we got going before they arrived and they all fell over. Michael Sundstrom in the Peugeot could also see the funny side of things, consistently fast and comfortably in the lead after the first three stages. What was the last forest stage like for you? Oh, it was very slippery and uh, plenty of snow and we took it with care, so it was second fastest there, but uh, we're still in lead, so no problem. Well, I think you're enjoying the conditions a bit, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Llewellyn in the Metro was also going well up to second after making a bad start. We had a bit of a moment on the first stage when I hit one of these little solid park benches which bent all the uh, tracking out on the back. Uh, but uh, it's going well now, the car's going well. What are you learning about the car as you're going along? Keep it out of the snow, because <laughs> once you touch the snow on the edge of the road it just pulls you in. I'm sure it's the same for everybody. Mark Lovell in the RS200 had been second fastest on the first stage. Two stages later he was tenth, but no cause for alarm. Well, we started off quite well on stage one, and um, from there on in we've just been trying some tyres. We nearly got the right mix now, so a few more stages to go and we might have the right ones. You were saying earlier that you thought it might be a bit slushy rather than arctic. I think you might have changed your mind now, eh? Oh, <laughs> it's very, very snowy. There's, a lot of, there's quite a bit of deep snow lying on the road which is it's good in a way because it's better than having ice so if we get the right tyres and we can cut into the snow we'll be away fastest on stage two was john Horgland in the skoda but as the cars headed off into the rest of the night stages more bad weather wasn't far away the next morning looks fine enough but a further six inches of snow had fallen overnight stages were being cancelled roads were blocked it was all turning into a nightmare for the rally controllers. Roger, Medic 1-0, we are. We've got a four-wheel drive vehicle awaiting at the start for further information, and he's going to go through over. Thank you for the information, Medic 10. Car control, stand by. To the organizers' credit, the rally went on. Four stages were rapidly cancelled, others severely modified. But nothing was hampering the progress of Michael Sundstrom. Speed may look a little ponderous, but remember, unlike Sweden, there are no studded tyres allowed here. By the end of the 12th stage, Sundström had a lead of almost two minutes over second-placed Hannu Mikkola. Mikkola, like everyone else, had an unhappy night and for most of it was giving second best to Llewellyn in the Metro. In the dawn, he'd moved up to second and was starting to match the pace of Sundstrom. But with the Peugeot in control, the contest between Mikola and Llewellyn for second was still very keen. Llewellyn, who likes to attack, having tiptoed his way through a night of quite appalling conditions. During the night, they were terrible, especially when it started snowing heavily, the reflections off the lights on the snow, and you could literally see five yards in front of you, and we have been visiting the scenery once or twice. Llewellyn third, but only 20 seconds behind second place Mikola. In fourth, Jimmy McRae getting to grips with the Metro after a poor start. The Group A contest, Penti Auricola in the Astra GTE. Andrew Wood had initially led Group A but went off in Giesborough and lost 10 minutes and Auricola would inherit the Group A lead. Russell Brooks maintaining the pride of the two-wheel drive contestants with fourth place. <laughs> John Horgland in the Skoda was producing another fine drive up to sixth position, but hanging over him a 10-minute road penalty for booking into a time control early.
Mark Lovell had to reverse out of one stage after spinning the RS200, but he's recovering, getting quicker, and up to fifth. At this point, Lightwater Valley, eight stages had been cancelled and the rally was running approximately 90 minutes late. But Sundstrom in the Peugeot was still two minutes ahead of the field. The Finn apparently heading for his first big win. That's how it seemed, but just around the corner, disaster. Michael, all a bit of a mess. What, what exactly happened? Well, we be began to, to spin there with the car and... Uh... I tried to straight up it and we hit the tree, that's, that's all, and that's the end. Bad luck because you were looking so much in command, weren't you? Mm, yeah, it was two minutes in front of Mikola, so... But th things like that can happen even then. What was the problem, do you feel, that this stage a little bit faster after all the, no, no, the no. caution in the forest? The, the, the thing was um, that the rear wheel came down, down on the field a little bit and the car began to spin. It was very slippery in this corner and... Great disappointment. Yeah. Bad luck. So for poor Michael Sundstrom, once again a momentary loss of concentration and a good result had gone. But he certainly proved his pace and potential for the rest of the season. <coughs> but one man was showing that in these conditions there's no substitute for experience. Anu Mikola was the new rally leader, but only 14 seconds ahead of Llewellyn in the Metro. And the aggressive Welshman looked poised to attack. When is the best place to attack in these kind of conditions? Um, it's quite difficult, because uh, we're running first car on the road since about halfway through the night. And of course the, the snow is about six or eight inches deep. Uh, so we're, we're acting a bit of a snowplow, and I think the others have got a slight advantage over us as far as that goes. Um, but with the snow, you can sort of lean it into the banks now and again. When you're, when you're coming down a hill and you're in a bit of trouble, you've just got to lean it into the snow bank to help you slow down. Um, but it's quite exciting driving, I must admit. And here at the stage at Croft, what's the approach here? Well, I think it's the big attack now, I think. You know, Hanno Micklick, who will blame me. Good beat him. <laughs> hey? The master in his sights then, but Croft was a spectator stage, and Hanu Mikola was determined to put on a real show. Mikola had won this event in 1980, 82 and 84, and was demonstrating why he was favourite in 86. But David Llewellyn was certainly producing that promised attack. Here at Croft, he matched Mikola's time, the lead remaining at 14 seconds. Equally fast and equally spectacular, Jimmy McRae, now in third place. Once again, the significant thing here is a very narrow value. And Russell Brooks fighting all the disadvantages of his two-wheel drive to lie forth. Because these cars are so much from the so... For John Hogland in the Skoda, the threat of a 10-minute road penalty has been removed and he's lying fifth. Another great performance from the small car, but soon he'd retire with a rare blown engine. Mark Lovell was getting faster all the time in the RS200. Four seconds off the pace at Croft, Hogland's demise would move him into fifth. Well, as you can see, after Croft, further heavy snow has paralyzed the rally even further. All plans for Sunday stages have been abandoned. Instead, the crews have come here to Dolby Forest to contest a series of stages which will decide the winner. They're calling it the Grand Prix of Yorkshire. In fact, it's a bit more like a World Cup downhill. But in a few minutes' time, the leaders, Hanu Mikola and David Llewellyn, will be disappearing into the darkness of Dolby to decide the winner of the National Breakdown Rally. Mikola off the line, no doubt sensing the pressure of the charging Llewellyn.
the 26-year-old just two stages away from his first international rally win. But the man in the way was his own great hero, Hanu Mikola. Llewellyn's response was electrifying. On the first Dolby stage, he was 26 seconds faster. Llewellyn led Mikola by 10 seconds. On the second, however, experience had the edge on enthusiasm. The Metro slipped into a ditch, Llewellyn lost 20 seconds, and the scene back at the finish in Bradford was a very familiar one indeed. Anu Mikola and Arnie Hertz win the opening round of the 1986 British Open Championship. For just 16 seconds, the margin of victory, the closest finish for years. With Llewellyn and McRae second and third in their MG Metro 6R4s, Britain clearly has cars and drivers to challenge the best. Circuit of Ireland. Well, that's the, the big problem, I suppose. We don't really know. Uh, the, even the works cars haven't done as tough an event as this, and it is the toughest event. So, I think initially we just take it a bit easy, just to see, you know, how everything's going to work. But I'm sure the car is quick enough to win the event. Uh, Billy Coleman, this time last year, you were having your first competitive drive in the Porsche. I think it took you just a little while to get to grips with it, but now it could be a different story. I hope it will be anyway, Gary. Um, as you say, last year I, I was very ill at ease with the car. It was my first first rally in it, and um, 12 months later now, um, I feel very confident with the car. And uh, mind you, the opposition has uh, got a bit tough in the meantime as well. But well, you started the season in great form in Galway, and of course uh, you have once more the, the camera inside the car. Are you used to that now? That's right. Yeah. Uh, I suppose I can't really make any mistakes with, with the camera, so that's uh, something to look out for. But I think uh, the weather is going to be crucial in this rally more than ever because there's a lot of talk about snow and with the four-wheel drive cars, even in dry conditions they've got an advantage, but if, if it turns snowy uh, or slush, they have a huge advantage. So uh, I just hope it doesn't get too, uh, too wintry. And of course the man with the second Rothmans Porsche, Saeed Al Hajri, also has a camera in the car, but this time it's right down at the front. Saeed, what sort of pictures do you think we're going to get from this camera? First thing, I hope this camera in good uh, safety place, you know, because if anything happened, this camera going to break down, you know. <laughs> You'll have much time once you get onto the stages, though, to, to make any telephone calls. Uh, no, and want to make sure it doesn't ring during the action either. Well, so far this morning, the only panic has been the late arrival of Austin McHale, whose Opel Manta was very late in arriving at the embankment. But there's no time control here. He didn't incur any penalties, and there doesn't seem to be any real problem. So the scene is set for the Circuit of Ireland 1986. Now we are waiting for the start. Miss Northern Ireland flags away the world's most successful rally driver, Hanno Mikola, in the Audi Quattro S1. Behind him, the RS200 of Cali Grandel, Ford's first serious challenge for victory in eight years. Then last year's winner, Jimmy McRae, this time in a Metro 6R4. He could equal Paddy Hopkirk's all-time record of five wins by Easter Tuesday. Stage one, and almost unbelievably, the drama of the 1986 event has started already. Grundle, not Mikula, is the first car through. Jimmy McRae follows, bedding his new car in gently, but still deceptively fast. Billy Coleman attacks right from the word go as we take our first lightning trip inside the Porsche. Hard right to crest. Repeat, hard right to crest. Hard right now. Hard left opens. 40. Sharp left. 60. Sharp right into hard left. Crest into square right. And sharp left. 70 over long crest, last pole, bad right. That is Mikola, stranded on the stage. Bad right. 
Saeed El Hajri in the second run of Porsche is about to show us the same piece of road from his low level camera, a first for rally television coverage. But back inside Coleman's car in stage two, we come across a greater problem. Kelly Grundle's Ford is parked in a gateway. From above, we see that the driver is left with no choices. There are spectators in the road. Kelly approaches the bend. There are two boys in the road. One escapes, but the other is hit. Luckily, he only suffers chest and leg injuries. A terrifying incident in a morning which generally saw excellent behavior. The Metro's lead, Jimmy McRae and Di Llewellyn, after stage one. Billy Coleman is now third in the Rothmans Porsche. Harry Toivonen, fourth overall in the 6R4 Metro. And Russell Brooks, fifth in the Manta 400. Michael Sundstrom is sixth in the 205 Turbo 16. He takes it very gently here. And Austin McHale really flying in seventh place. El Hajri is in eighth and about to run into trouble as he approaches a flat out right hander after a very, very fast straight. still want to be a rally driver? Miraculously, the only damage was to the lights and the rear bumper. Mark Lovell in the more fortunate four heralds the arrival of Mikola, who is desperately trying to stay in the event. Uh, you've had uh, quite a bit to do to your car. Yes, uh, you know, we had a clutch problem. The other of those uh, main cylinders got stuck and uh, it took quite a while for me to to get it loose on the stage, uh, so they lost 14 minutes. Problems are normal in rallying, but the shattered windscreen of Cali Grundle's car signified a much deeper despair. The accident was unavoidable, but now the Swedish driver has to unscramble his agonized thoughts and go back into that competition. Understandably, he did not want to talk about it. And as the cars head off to the next stage, you can see just how popular rallying has become and the problems that popularity can cause. A long line of traffic leading into Tobermore was also repeated in Cookstown and Macrofelt, among other places. David Llewellyn, who so nearly won the first round of the British Championship, the National Breakdown Rally, is proving it was no fluke. He's a second quicker than McRae over Tully Creer and Bridge. The Metro domination continues. Sundstrom will tie with Coleman here, three seconds slower than the leader. The Irishman can take comfort in being the best placed of the two who drive cars. Russell Brooks, in the ultimate development of the Manta 400, is now heading towards his favorite North Antrim stages. And Austin McHale in the so-called welterweight shell of Bull Manta must be happy with his sixth place at this stage of the event. But if Hanu Mikola is going to retain his championship lead, it'll mean driving at 10 tenths for the next four days. Quattro certainly moving at a cracking pace. Halle Grundle, now with lights ablaze, is also trying to make up for lost time. But by the time Louise Aiken Walker arrives, the weather has worsened and her Nissan 240RS is caught out on the wrong tires. Russell Brooks, the blend on stage, is a home from home. It was where he took the lead in the Ulster Rally, and again, he is fastest over at this time. The Mantas seem to revel in it. Austin McHale is almost over the edge in the Shell Oil Steeler Opal Team Island car. 
and the charging Mikula lifting a wheel as the 500 brake horsepower goes down on the road with the Audi Quattro. 58th place after his troubles in the early stages and the Quattro is eating up the lower numbers. Callie Grundle is now 35th, knuckling down to the job like a true professional. But his heart can hardly be in it. Next, the ever-exciting Pentia Ricola, leading Group A. And no wonder. Coleman comes up the other side of the valley in the equally spectacular or large stage. Even if the scenic glens of Antrim are not at their best, there's plenty of good vantage points. The hairpin at Aura Lodge is not the place to be stuck in second gear, and that's Mark Lovell's problem. Mikola seems to ascend even quicker than the descent. He will make up six places in these nine miles to make him 19th overall. Cyril Bolton in the Clubman specification, press part 6R4, is now in the top 10. Ahead of him, Vincent Bonner, 9th overall. Evidence of rally misfortunes of the past are everywhere, as John Price is in 24th place on the Renault 5 Turbo is trying to make up places. Then come the two 240 RS Nissans belonging to Englishman Simon Davidson and Belfast driver Dan Daly. Square right, at long crest, and bad right. Sharp left, 30. Fast right, 30. Crest 40, left and square left. Repeat, crest 40, left and square left, one half farm mud. We're leading the two-wheel drive brigade and uh, we seem to be splitting the four-wheelers. So, uh, and in fact, we've taken a small bit of time. Um, I think we're just 54 seconds off the lead now, so that's not so bad. Well, I think that's the big story. You're actually taking time back off the metros at the moment. Well, it, it appears that the, uh, David and Jimmy had some uh, minor excursions on a couple of the stages, so um, we had a fairly smooth run. There was a lot of mud on the road here and there. In fact, there was even ice on the last one which cut out a few people, but uh, I, I think it's, it's narrowing down slightly, yeah. Well, your Galway practice would uh, be good for the icy one. That's right, yeah. Although, I, I can tell you, could have done without the eyes at 4 o'clock this morning. Crest at the turn, by right down cut. 60. Square right. Day two of the Rothman Circuit of Ireland Rally, 1986, and a long night's driving behind the crew, 60 of whom left Belfast at half past three in the morning. It's now eight o'clock, and 59 of them are making their way into Dublin. The man who's missing, though, is Said Al Hajri. Somewhat sensational, it must be said. The man driving the other Rothmans Porsche, and the man who had that marvelous low slung camera, which gave us great shots last night. He's gone from the rally, having gone off the road on special stage 12, Bells Hill, near Baranahinch in County Down. You know, Porsche, very, very sideways cars. And I came very quick for, uh, like, very tight pint, you know, like a medium right, something like this. And I can't stop the cars, you know, and uh, just I go sideways and I go down to the field. And the cars are uh, not coming uh, out. There was... Hanu Mikula is facing what seems like Mission Impossible, whose first day clutch problems dropped him to 58th at one point, but he's fighting back.
Quattro is fairly crackling along. But is it a case of for whom the bell tolls? After the midi right angles of the RDS, we climb into real rally country. Two stages whose names are whispered in awe when any tales of the circuit of Ireland are told. Sally Gap and Ockavana. The fans had largely ignored the city centre entertainment, which had been laid on for them, and flocked in their customary thousands to the Dublin mountains. Nature had added snow to the intriguing equation. 27 miles of the best rallying country were now ahead. Jimmy McRae has a 21 second advantage over his metro mate, David Llewellyn. Billy Coleman is only 41 seconds adrift of the supercars. Strangely, he is not particularly looking forward to the next 27 miles as he doesn't think they will suit the Porsche. But let's go inside as we come up to Sally Gap. Fast left, 70. Turn by right. As he turned bad right, to sharp left, 70 kink. Left 30, slow right 40. Repeat 40 kink. Sharp right to sharp left. Brooks in fifth, must attack. He's no stranger to this country. And Kelly Grundy has only four seconds in hand over the English driver. Not a comfortable position. Then comes Austin McHale. These are his two favorite stages in Ireland. Harry Toivon in the Unipark Metro is sixth, but only one minute, 29 seconds behind Russell Brooks. And there is great home support for Vincent Bonner in the Opel Escona 400. Ninth overall, and loving every moment of it. Ocavana, Llewellyn is on the wrong times. Billy Coleman is driving beautifully, but he can't match the power of the metros in the mountains. Brooks leaps the lightweight Manta, and he moves up to fourth place. At Keller Grundle's expense in the Ford. McHale in his home country, and the crowds are out to cheer him on. Harry Toivonen, who comes from the famous Finnish family, is ahead on the road of another famous spin, who we are sadly just about to see the last of. Hanno Mikola retires later on that stage with suspension problems. Vincent Bonner leaps his way towards the Kilkenny service hall. Even on the road, so they open the bumps? Aye, open the little bumps, it's more like a, it's more like a, a ball joint. Right? Okay. And then, when you really have the hard bumps, Sure, the service organizer for Billy Coleman. There's a lot of work going on with the, the wheels and the steering at the moment. Is there a problem? There's no problem at the moment. It's just retracking the steering, centering the steering up. The steering wheel seems to be a little off center, so it's just recentering it so that it feels better in his hands. The weather has turned a bit nasty now. What sort of tires are you going to give him for the next stages? We're going on a, a combination wets and front and intermediate rails as a, a combination to suit all conditions. Jimmy McRae holds his lead as the Metro 6R4 splashes onto stage 19. Welshman Llewellyn tries hard, but still loses another five seconds to the flying Scott. Coleman's control driving in the Rothmans Porsche is quicker than either of the Metros here. But Callie Grundle is the quickest of the lot. Stage 20, Fort Law. Cars are heading back to Waterford. Llewellyn is trying to dust off the opposition. Billy Coleman goes through, but the car is sounding rough. Three-time circuit winner Russell Brooks is having a trouble-free run in the Manta. But Coleman has a definite problem at the back of the Porsche. Slow pump on the right rear. Yeah. Long mid right. 300, press 30, quick right, 300. Yeah, 300. Right side over crest, 80, slide right, 200. Press one half, mid left, tightens, maybe west, 30. Fast right opens, 300. Vincent Bonner also has his hands full in the Opel Ascona 400. <laughs> Coleman's rear tyre is now completely flat, and it's vibrating badly. I 
Maar de wereld heeft de wereld ook aan de mij laten. Dit kan. Englishman Simon Davison and Mark Atkinson are enjoying the final stage of the day, which is more than you can say for Colton and Morgan, as they lose a lot of time and drop a place on the leaderboard. Well, that's another shame. No, I know that. My God, the last stage into Waterford is bad luck for us, isn't it? Waterford at last, and a welcome break for the crews. What an eventful day it's been. Saeed Al Hajri crashing out early on, and Hanu Mikola finally calling it a day with suspension problems. But it's been a good day for Jimmy McRae. And we've had no problems today. We seem to have been in the right, well, near enough the right tyre at the right time. Which was the one that made the big difference, Sally Gap, Agavana? Sally Gap, eh, Agavana coming down, it was very wet, and we had a, a, an intermediate wet tyre and it really paid off there. Yeah. Hopefully tomorrow I'll make some correct uh, tyre choices and Jimmy won't, so uh, we'll be able to grab a bit more time back off him. But uh, as you say, they are very fast stages and uh, the Metro has got a, a good top speed, so it will suit the car very well. Apart from tyre choice, there's been no other problems? No, it's um, been going very well. Uh, the car has run perfectly. We've had a few small brake problems, but uh, nothing more than that. Billy Coleman, it was all going perfectly until just before the, the village of Port Law on the last stage. That's right, Tom. Uh, we, we had our annual Saturday afternoon puncture coming into Waterford in the last stage. Um, not as bad as last year, but it's cost us about four minutes. So it means that we're now fourth. We, we dropped one place. And uh, I think we're about five minutes off the lead and we had been just over one. Well, there are Louise, it seems to have been a day of choosing the right tyres and uh, keeping out of the slippery bits. How's it gone for you? Well, I think we've uh, just run an intermediate all day because it's uh, a little bit muddy on the on the corner, so we're just playing safe at the moment. Well, now, of course, you're, you're years ahead almost in the ladies' prize, but it's not really the ladies' prize you're interested in, is it? No, we're having a good battle with this man in front here, Vince. We're surprised to be in the top ten at the moment because since we have left Belfast, we have not had problems with fuel starvation. And as we're coming on down, the country is getting worse and worse and worse. We're trying to eliminate it. It's very, very hard to get the problem back. The time rapidly running out here in service at Waterford, Michael Sidstrom. Yeah, we had to change the gearbox now, the, the, the complete gearbox. And it seems that um, the mechanics do very, very good and quick work because they have worked only 15 minutes and now it seems to be ready in maybe two, three minutes. So you, you've had fuel starvation problems really throughout the, the rally so far? Well, since the second stage, since Belfast, we have uh, had this problem. And they're trying everything and anything, but they just don't seem to be able to get it, you know? Who have you got in service crew? Because I see a familiar face behind you. Yes, yeah, Sydney Meek and, and the boys, they're looking after the car since we started. And uh, they've called on now the Opel people to have a look at it and see what, you know, can they do anything with it, you know? Looks as though it's one of those things that we're, we'll probably find out about one stage to go or something like that. We're on stage 24, Dunmoon, high in the hills above Villiers Town in County Waterford, John Tracy Country. This Circuit of Ireland rally, this marathon, has not yet run half its course. Could this thing yet be in the team? Interestingly enough, I'm leaving Dungar for the service area there. Austin McHale with a smile on his face said, this rally's only just beginning. Jimmy McRae probably wishes it was over, with him as winner of course, but those clutch problems are getting worse. For David Llewellyn, it's a chance to snatch back the lead, and he's closing all the time. Henry Teufenen is still going strong in the third Metro, giving Austin Rover their third car in the top six. But in the battle for the top, there's a new leader. Llewellyn has overtaken the fray, but success seems to have made him a little twitchy. Russell Brooks hasn't put a wheel wrong so far, quietly moving up to second. McRae is back in third, and he's stuck in second here. And that 
left, slow right over crest, 30. Not left here, slow right over crest, 30. Sharp right opens, 100. Mid left, 100 kick. There are problems ahead for Billy Coleman. This is what the spectators saw. Now the driver's view of the same incident. Turn half and left gravel. Repeat, turn half and left gravel, 40. Easy left, one quarter. But within seconds, Ronan Morgan and Billy Coleman are flying again. Repeat, quick left, 300. Press left, 200, kink over crest. Easy right, 400. Repeat, easy right, 400. Easy right, 50. Long easy right, 80. Easy left over crest, 70. Quick left, 400. Austin McHale was almost caught out on the same point. But Simon Davison's Nissan 240RS was completely sideways. Meanwhile, further into the stage, there's another change of surface for the drivers to contend with as they find snow lying on the Knockmill Down Mountains. So far today, there's been heavy rain, light rain, sunshine, and now snow. Who'd be a service manager trying to pick the right tires to cope with all that? Due to Petray's problems, David Llewellyn is now without pressure for the first time in the rally. But Russell Brooks can never relent as he fights against the advance of technology. And Billy Colvin, who continues to fight as only he can to make back lost time. As he descends into the Nair Valley, this was ironically replaced yesterday. Vincent Bonner is a much happier man. As others fail, Vincent rises up the top ten. Also climbing are the more standard cars, like Stanley Oil's Toyota. Billy Coleman's Porsche may not be pretty, but fortunately the effect of the crash is cosmetic rather than structural. Mark Lovell is getting closer and closer as the Englishman takes full advantage of his trouble-free Sunday run. The long hours on the road are beginning to tell. Simon Davidson indulges in a time-consuming but damage-free spin. Not only the scenery is beautiful as we get to the closing stages of an action-packed Easter Sunday, a day which has brought a new leader, David Llewellyn. Russell Brooks leads the two-wheel drive cars in second place. And Jimmy McRae with a new gearbox charges back with three fastest times to third place. One young rally fan just doesn't want to hear about Goldman's misfortune. The Corkman is now fourth, and his gearbox is crying enough. Mark Lovell's confidence grows by the mile. He has moved from eighth to fifth today. And another young man who is making a big name for himself in Group B, Henry Toyman, sixth tonight in Waterford. Then the two Irish old opals of Austin McHale and Vincent Bonner. There are still three home crews in the top ten and rising. We now join the... The closing chapter of day three of the Circuit of Ireland Rally is providing high drama here in the Rothmans pen in the uh, service halt. 
because both Rothman's cars need attention. We've got Jimmy McRae in need of a differential. We've got Billy Coleman's Porsche in need of a new gearbox. Interestingly, that is the very fault that put Toivonen out of the rally in a similar car just two years ago. The mechanics are under pressure. Will they make it in time for tomorrow? I can change it in about a quarter of an hour, so I, with any luck, we, sh we should be okay. But uh, you can see the way these guys work. I have most faith in them. The team of mechanics, led by Dick Goodman, responded magnificently. The old gearbox was whipped out and the new one installed in just 12 and a half minutes. And the spanner men were hard at work on Llewellyn's car too, although he was able to finish the day with a smile on his face. Sorry? Got still there after three days, going well? <laughs> yes, uh, Jimmy's had a, a bit of bad luck really today. Gearbox problem and uh, a puncture on the stage to stop him changing. So that's put him like seven minutes behind us. So I'm feeling good. There. What's the... Coming round the mountain of Sleeve Laval, the leader. These right angular bends suit the mountain. But there are reports that Billy Coleman has a misfire. But we can't detect it here. Jimmy McRae isn't making any great inroads on Llewellyn at the moment. But here's the story of the day so far. Mark Lovell is closing rapidly on Coleman. And the new Ford is hungry for fourth place. Another fast mover for Unipart Metro. In the top ten, we still have four four-wheel drive cars. Sadly, at the end of this 13-mile trip round Sleet Le Mans, we are missing Vincent Bonner. The engine has finally given up, and Davidson moves up to eight. A bit of a problem for us. Both stages were very, very muddy, and in a two-wheel drive car, uh, you have real serious problems with traction, and we lose out a lot of time to the four-wheel drive cars. I think something in the region of 20 to 30 seconds a stage. And this is this morning, it really is a bit of four-wheel drive cars. And, um, I think it's about 20 seconds in the first couple there. Now. Difficult day for tyre choice once again. Yes, we're uh, opting for the safe choice all the time, and uh, I think that's the way for us to treat it at the moment. Uh, what we're really looking forward to is the sections in Galway, Partry Mountains, and uh, maybe some of these cars will have problems again. I still think that a lot of things can happen, and I, I firmly believe I have a really good chance to. The Circuit of Ireland Rally has returned to Tipperary this year, part of the world where the scenery is attractive in the extreme. But one of the local landmarks is Keeper Hill here. And they say around these parts that if it snows on Keeper Hill on Easter Monday, the tenants get a year rent free. Well, it's Easter Monday, there's no snow at Keeper Hill, but the Circuit of Ireland Rally is going through this part of the world. The heat is really on as the professionals revel in these glorious stages, seven miles south of Nina. Jimmy McRae is rapidly catching Russell Brooks, but not David Llewellyn. But that misfire in the Porsche has cost Coleman 32 seconds over Brooks in the two-wheel drive battle. Lovell's progress is electrifying in the Ford. The current British national champion is now nine seconds behind Coleman in fifth place. Harry Toivonen's excellent run is now being hampered by electrical problems, and he arrives at stage 34 in quite a flap. The Shell Manta 400, driven by Austin McHale, is undoubtedly one of the entertainers of the event, as the Dubliner flings the Black Manta around with gay abandon. Llewellyn's position at the head of the field remains secure. As he heads into Galway, the young Welshman says he'd be happy if the rally ended now. Russell Brooks has been driving brilliantly throughout the day, holding second place in spite of a painful hip injury. His team manager is searching Galway for a physiotherapist. Coleman's car still bears the scars from yesterday's accident, but it's still going well. However, the final stage of the day is another of those hairy moments.
right flat, 200 over crest. And once again, the cork farmer comes out unscathed. I understand you had a bit of a problem when you were seeking physiotherapy. I don't know what it is, but uh, I woke up this morning with a terrible pain in my backside. <laughs> and it wasn't Mike Broad either. <laughs> Pullman is in fourth place and uh, a very popular fourth place, of course. But um, you've had a few problems. Mostly small problems today, uh, George. Um, the big problem we've had, of course, that bloody puncture two days ago. And uh, no matter what I do, I can't seem to uh, make up the time. Um, we had a bit of an accident yesterday, which, of course, was in desperation, trying to make up four minutes, which is not easy to do. <laughs> and um, uh, we just can't really crack Russell Brooks. That's, that's the position of it. The margin is exactly the same. We've done six stages since Waterford, and literally every second one he's beaten us, we've beaten him, and never more than three seconds in it, so not a lot you can do in that situation. Half past seven on day five, the final day of the 1986 Rothman Circuit of Ireland Rally. We're in Oma, it's a damp day, but it's been a night of high drama. Two of the top contenders are now out. We lost Billy Coleman and Jimmy McRae, the Rothman's Porsche, the Rothman's Metro. Stand back up there! But there are still four stages to go. For Russell Brooks and Mike Broad, it's gently, gently to the finish. But for Austin McHale and Mark Lovell, these stages will decide third place. On Aura Lodge and Glen Dunn, the Dubliner responds magnificently to the challenge. Despite a misgear change here, he has stemmed the avalanche of time. Mark Lovell continues to close, but not at the rate he had prior to Balamoney. The Dubliner now is in with a real chance of retaining that third position from the flying Ford. At the Sala and Glen O stages, David Llewellyn's dreams are beginning to look a reality. and Austin Rover are proving an enormous point about the quality of their product. Then it's all eyes glued for the last ditch efforts of the Shell Dealer Opel Team Island Manta. McHale after 24 hours of the road is calling on his last reserves. Third would be a dream come true for the Irish champion, but can he stop the advance of the RS200? Now it's level. After 650 stage miles, only 23 are left, and Mark has to pull back a further 47 seconds. That's over two seconds a mile. Has the four that much of an advantage? The answer is no. After five days motoring, Austin McHale retains third place by two seconds. And the winning combination of man and machine duly arrived at the City Hall to be officially proclaimed number one and enjoy the acclamation of the crowd. David Llewellyn, you're probably the winner of one of the toughest Circuit of Ireland's ever. Thank you very much. I'm chuffed a bit. Very pleased. Fantastic day for yourself and of course a fantastic day for Wales. Yes, um, it's a fantastic day for me. Um, it's my first international win and uh, also for the car. It's the first international win for the car. And uh, I think it's the first Welshman ever to win the rally as well. So uh, all together I'm absolutely chuffed a bit. I'm a fire, yeah. Trade, I believe. That's right. Yes, um, I love the love the farm, and whenever I'm not rallying, uh, I go straight home to the farm and uh, help out. But is there anybody there special, or you're still a single man? <laughs> there is somebody there special, <laughs> but uh, I am still a single man. Uh, just I think. And how are you going to celebrate this great victory? <laughs> Lots of Guinness, I think. Uh, that would be the order. 
your long-term ambitions in, in the rallying? The highest, of course, world champion. Pleased to say it won't happen. To the victor of the laurels, with the Welsh dragon triumphant, they'll be singing in the valleys tonight. Providing a reminder of the heroics that Wales expected from the local favourite, David Llewellyn, who won the last round, the Circuit of Ireland, and now led the championship in his MG Metro 6R4. Since the win on the circuit, what kind of a celebrity have you become in this part of the world? <laughs> well, I think I've got about 300 uh, fates to open and uh, church bazaars and <laughs> all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, um, you know, everybody in Wales is, is great and supporting me and... Uh, uh, I've been told that if I don't win this rally, I'm not allowed back into Wales, so... <laughs> does this increase the pressure, though, as you come um, in? Yeah, it does a little. Uh, obviously, you know, I'd love to win the event anyway. Um, and the approach for every rally is the same, you know, you're there to win it. So I've got to be careful, really, not to overdo it uh, and to try and uh, control myself and uh, uh, keep the car on the road and get a good result. Right. Hanu let you off rather lightly on the, on the circuit. Would you regard Hanu as the main opposition? Yes, um, Hanno and Stig, of course. Uh, they're both ex-world champion, both very, very experienced. And uh, I'm sure that Hanno is out to get his own back. Um, I think he's won the Welsh several times. And uh, he, he'll be there to prove his point. It's not only Mikola who's dominated the event, but the Quattro's. Four wins in four years. This is Valdegard in 82. Stig Blomquist, winner for Audi in 83. He was returning with Ford in 1986. And Hanu Mikola, winner of the Welsh in an escort in 78 and 79, a winner again with Audi in 1984. The former world champion, no lover of the tarmac, but a master in the forests. Then last year, four out of four for the Quattro's, Britain's Malcolm Wilson at the wheel. Five. The news, just the day before the start of the death of Henry Toivonen in the Corsica rally, cast an air of gloom over this year's Welsh. Mikola had been close to Toivonen all his life and was deeply affected by the tragedy as he set off. Stig Blomquist in the Ford RS200, one of the powerful Group B cars which would come under renewed scrutiny after events in both Corsica and Portugal. But lifting the mood, Llewellyn celebrating his 27th birthday as the cars left Cardiff. Ahead of them, a two-day sprint compared to the marathon of the Circuit of Ireland, but a very testing one, over 278 miles of tarmac and forest. The event began on the notorious Epid Ranges, high-speed stages with countless crests and blind brows that put the emphasis on local knowledge and a combination of caution and courage. Mikola and Blomquist, comparative strangers to Epid in recent years, started with caution as the main priority. Llewellyn claims that he dislikes Epint as much as anyone, but he was immediately faster than the Metro of Jimmy McRae and significantly faster than Hanu Mikola and Stig Blomquist. Russell Brooks in the rear-wheel drive Manta was struggling once again to keep in touch with his more powerful rivals. Michael Sundstrom, yet to finish in this year's championship, was definitely taking things easy in the Peugeot. And also overdue for a good result, Mark Lovell in the other Ford RS200. Spectacular in the Nissan, Britain's top woman driver, Louise Aitken Walker. Llewellyn, meantime, was doing more than enough to keep the demanding Welsh supporters happy, leaving a couple of former world champions trailing in his wake. Hanu Mikola was happy for a brief respite from the Epin tarmac as the rally tackled its first forest stage.
Dick Blomquist in his first British rally since the 1983 RAC was also struggling to match the times of Llewellyn. Michael Sundström, remember, crashed out of the first round of the championship within sight of victory. Mechanical failure prevented a finish in Ireland, so he's determined to go the whole way this time. <laughs> Trying hard, but with very little reward, Russell Brooks in the two-wheel drive Manta, now losing more time on the loose surface. big problem hit Lovell in the RS200. A pipe failure puts the turbo out of action and Lovell, desperate for a result, is limping. Back on the Epin tarmac, David Llewellyn continues to fly. He'd been fastest on the first four stages to take the early lead from Jimmy McRae, Mikola and Blomquist. Nicola's Audi spitting flame as the three times winner of the Welsh International responds to the challenge. And if you want proof of his commitment at this point, just look at the object swinging from the driver's door. Nicola has taken the timekeeper's clock with him in his eagerness to fire off the start line. Blomquist, his times slowly improving, was hampered slightly by a gearbox problem at this point, but that was nothing compared to Mark Lovell's trouble in the other Ford. Michael Sundström still in contention and still in the rally, and that's all the Peugeot bosses were asking of him at this stage. Russell Brooks, happy to be on the tarmac again. He was back among the faster times, but a long way off the overall lead. Lovell stutters along, a frustrating start for the national champion, who'd been teamed with a new co-driver in an attempt to inspire a better result. The Group A battle predictably led early on by Penty Auricola in the Astra GTE. But Penty would disappear from the fray after an accident involving a spectator's car. Challenger Andrew Wood also was destined to go out after rolling his Astra. Back in the forest, the powerful, spectacular Group B cars so threatened in the current troubled climate of the sport really show their paces. Despite all that caution, this is a last glimpse of the Peugeot of Michael Sundström, shortly to retire with a punctured turbocharger pipe. Russell Brooks down to sixth in the Manta, trailing five of the four-wheel drive cars. And another four-wheel drive car was closing rapidly. Mark Lovell's turbocharger problem was sorted, and his times were now matching the leaders. The new partnership in the RS200, a lot happier. Also happy, Louise Aitken-Walker, heading for fifth overall, her best championship finish. The Group A battle, taken up by Sebastian Lindholm in the Audi, and he would eventually lose out to Dave Metcalf, deserved Group A winner in the Astra. Always a favourite, John Hogland in the Skoda, once again taking honours in the 1600cc category of Group B. The battle at the front takes a dramatic turn. Llewellyn's lead has gone, and so too is a fair bit of the Metro's bodywork. David, a flying start, and then problems. What happened? Yes, um, we got off to a nice start. We, we, we actually had about a 45-second lead, and on stage seven, it, uh, it all went a bit wrong. Um, the car got slightly out of line with me and uh, hit the gravel on the outside of the bend and half spun, and we took off into a ditch at about 80 miles an hour and uh, 
I just closed my eyes and waited for it to stop. Quite a lot happened. Phil reckoned we went upside down, but I'm not quite so sure whether we did or not. But uh, when we came to a stop, we were facing the wrong way down the stage in a big ditch and had to drive about 100 yards down the ditch actually to get out. And we'd uh, broken a wheel as well, so we had to drive to the end of the stage then uh, on this wheel, just spokes really. Um, so we lost about a minute then. So uh, Jimmy's, I think, is about 20 or 30 seconds in the lead now. A bit of frantic activity going on here as a result. <laughs> and the gearbox change as well? Yes. Um, obviously, we knocked a lot of the bits off the car and uh, hasn't been handling too well since then. Uh, so the boys are giving it a good check over now to try and get us as straight as they can. Um, and the gearbox changes to give us lower gearing for the forestry stages uh, from now on. Yeah, we must have been very heartened by the times we were setting early on. Yes, um, you know, I was very pleased with the way it was going. And uh, one very small, uh, I don't know what they call it, mistake or, or um, over-eagerness, um, let it all fly. But, I mean, we're still in the race, so uh, hopefully with it, uh, the boys doing a few measurements and sorting it out so that we'll be back on the pace again. Glad to see the back of Ed Pint and glad yes. to see the forest coming up. Sure. I, I told you I didn't like Ed Pint, didn't I? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't like it even worse now. <laughs> By dawn in the forest, Llewellyn's patched up car hit the front again. McRae, Mickler and Blomquist have been swapping the lead throughout the night. And we appeared set for a tremendous climax as the man the Welsh insist is a world champion of the future tried to resist the challenge of two world champions of the past. Anu Mikula snatches the lead here in Dubby Forest. And Stig Blomquist, after his cautious start and puncture problems, has been fastest on seven stages up to the restart. Russell Brooks was struggling to hang on to fifth, the resurgent Mark Lovell closing on him all the time. Lovell's turbo problems were behind him. He'd recorded one fastest time in the night, no doubt spurred on by Roger Freeman, the new man in the passenger seat. How's the new partnership working out in the it's car? It's going very well, really, because it's under a lot of stress with being the first event and being especially a sprint event. Roger's getting, we're getting on quite well, really. We've right. had our mishaps, though. Like what? Oh, just not being used to the sort of language that he uses and stuff that I'm used to. Right. Now, what's the task for the rest of the day? What do you think you can achieve in the last Go few as hours? as fast as we can. <laughs> with what sort of place in mind? Hopefully for God. next year. Look for that. Need to go. Roger Freeman doing his job of providing the urgency in Lovell's challenge. No shortage of urgency in the battle for the lead as Mikola was challenged by a charging Llewellyn in the torrential rain of Glenapan. Llewellyn was an astonishing 21 seconds faster than Mikola on this four and a half mile stage and the forests and the valleys were already starting to celebrate. But those celebrations didn't last long. On the very next stage, Llewellyn misjudged a hairpin and launched the Metro off a 60-foot drop. The car dived down a bank into the trees. Llewellyn and co-driver Phil Short emerged comparatively unscathed. And once again, an amateur cameraman caught the final seconds of the horrifying plunge that spelt the end of all the Welsh hopes. Well, basically, we were going too quickly uh, on the approach to this corner. Um, it, it, the road was just a slight left-hander, and it was just going away from me all the time, and uh, I thought that I was well under control, and it just sort of tightened up at the last minute before coming into this hairpin. And as you can see, we, we've just come over the bank and hit this road and, and ended up down there in the trees. But uh, happily, that both Phil and I are okay, and the, the roll cage in the car you know, saved us very well. Stood up pretty well. Actually landed on its roof, did it? Yes, the boys have actually just tipped it over to see whether they can drag it out for me to, to take it home yeah. in a box. <laughs> <laughs> it must have gone on forever, this accident, or seemed like it. What, what were your thoughts as you went over the edge there? Well, yes, it didn't actually go on that long. I mean, we were still on the wheels coming down across the, uh, across the bank there, um, but I could see it was going to end up in a pretty... A big accident when we hit the the road here then it started going end over end that's all i can remember was seeing the the twigs of these trees because as you can see the the twigs have been broken up here um and uh, and then it just came to a, a sudden stop uh the most frightening bit was being upside down and not being able to open the doors to get out and petrol actually tripping in the cab uh, that was quite frightening but luckily there's spectators here and they uh, 
They ripped the doors open when we got out. It left Stig Blomquist in the Ford RS200, challenging Mikola with Jimmy McRae third. But Blomquist's suspension is hopping around, and Sweden's former world champion would retire with suspension failure on the very next stage. So Mikola kept a 20-second cushion between himself and McRae to take a record fourth Welsh international. The great man showing all his professionalism, starting the event just hours after the tragic news of the death of his close friend Henry Toivonen. At the finish he talked of the sad loss of one of the sport's great stars. It was really terrible news uh, and uh, you know I have I have known Henry from uh, when he was a kid so you know I five years old you know so I, it's very hard to believe it has happened. This time, I think he was the fastest driver around, you know, winning uh, RAC Monte Carlo, and everything was just open for him, and, uh, you know, it's a really terrible thing. It's been a sad start to the season all round with it's stories been, like really, this. The debate is, is going on in the papers about exactly where the sport is going. What is your view about the power of the cars and the kind of events that we see them competing in? Yeah, it's a two, two problems, you know, the first one is the spectators and uh, we have been extreme lucky not to have any big problems and uh, accidents before. They have been really, you know, on the cards all the time and now it looks like uh, we are getting nearly every, on the every, every rally something and of course then uh, driver's point of view, cars are very, very fast now and uh, of course your reaction time is much uh, less what you, you used to have and every bend is uh, you know you have to brake and uh, decide the speed so it makes it much uh, much more difficult you know and uh, if i think uh, you know i have been driving maybe 20 already 23 years so we used to have a good races even 15 years ago what is the answer though do you think there is a crisis facing the sport at the moment when uh, rallying has become so important like it is now, pub publicity and all. Uh, all the factories, of course, are trying to do their best. And when the factories are putting money and uh, all the knowledge what they have got, it's just the uh, one way to go, and that's forward. And uh, so you have to be very careful when you make the regulations, because normally people intend to go around those. So it has to be simple, re uh, simple regulation how to how to reduce the speed. Let's not get gloomy about the future because you've had a great win this weekend. Congratulations. Thank you. Jimmy McRae, no victories but great experience on the Scottish. He started the event saddened by what he saw as a possible overreaction to the sport's problems. I think everybody's overreacted, especially Fiza and probably Audi as well. And yes, I'm disappointed in one way that Hanu is not here. Uh, because uh, towards the tail end of the Welsh, I think we had the better of them and it would have been nice to have beaten them in Scotland where he's beaten me twice. Uh, but in saying that, it's one less to worry about. Another reaction to the safety problems was the shortening of the Scottish. Fifteen stages had been lost and with it, much of the event's character. It has altered the Scottish quite a bit because in the Scottish you could, you know, if you were uh, in difficulty in some of the rough sections, you could back off a bit and try and make up elsewhere, whereas now I think it's going to be a flat out blast right from the one go. McRae got the chance to show the flat out approach on the opening one mile spectator stage in Bella Houston Park in Glasgow. Not so flat out was the Ford RS200 of Mark Lovell, who hit gearbox problems right on the start line. The gearbox was hastily changed, but Lovell was plumb last after just one stage. Well, we lost all the gears as we pulled in to start stage one, and we only had fourth gear. And it was quite noisy, so we had to take a very steady, bad start. So what's caused it then? Do we know? Good. We haven't got a clue. All the testing, everything, everything's been fine, and put a new box in for the start of this event and just let us down. What are they doing now? Changing the box? Yeah, they've changed the box. It's only taken about 14, 15 minutes, so hopefully we'll be away and that'll last us now. 
the rest of the rally. Lovell was one of the main hopes of breaking the threatened dominance of a whole fleet of MG Metro 6R4s led by last year's winner Malcolm Wilson. In hot pursuit, Jimmy McRae, three stages gone, and McRae and Wilson are tied for the lead. <laughs> Staying on the fringe of the Metro battle is Michael Sundstrom in the Peugeot. In fourth place, another Metro, and at the wheel, Per Eklund. Fifth in the forests of Glendevon and Pitt Medan was David Llewellyn, making a seemingly cautious start. Metros filled seven of the first eight places because Llewellyn was followed by Ken Wood, Harry Toivonen and David Gillanders. But then it was the first of the rear-wheel drive cars, and what a spectacle, Bjorn Valdegaard in the Toyota. Russell Brooks in the ever-reliable Manta was 10th and a good solid finish for Russell could see him heading the championship at the end. Leading the Group A battle, the Astra GTE of Andrew Wood, his usual rival, Penti Auricola, right behind in his Astra. John Horgland in the Skoda once again headed the Group B 1600cc class. And climbing his way back after that bad start, Mark Lovell already just outside the top 10 in the RS200. But the first exchanges have certainly belonged to Austin Rover, and day two didn't indicate any change in that domination. The only concerns for Malcolm Wilson had been a rear brake failure and slight overheating, but he's built a lead of around 20 seconds over Jimmy McRae. Wilson was a surprise winner of the Scottish last year in a privately entered Audi Quattro. Now returning 12 months later as a fully fledged world championship contender, he's certainly the man to beat. McRae was having a comparatively trouble-free run. His only complaint, like that of many of the other drivers, was that the long road sections in between the rescheduled stages of the event actually increased fatigue rather than eased it. But McRae was comfortably in second on the event he so desperately wanted to win. Still third, the talented but unpredictable Finn Michael Sundstrom. Peugeot breaking the Metro domination aided by Ford because Lovell had now moved up to fifth. In fourth place, holding the position he'd been in since the Glasgow start, was David Llewellyn, about two minutes behind the battling Wilson and McRae. But then the first hint of Metro problems to come. Ken Wood had already retired, and this is the last glimpse of Pear Eklund, shortly to drop out with a blown engine. For Llewellyn, just off the pace, the problems here weren't so much mechanical as psychological. Taking uh, a long time to settle in after the, the crash on the Welsh, you know, things aren't sort of flowing, you know, just trying to build my confidence again, you know, it's, uh, it's taking longer than I thought. And you know, every time you come to a bend, I think, oh, is it going to tighten, you know, is it, is it going to be like the bend on the Welsh, you know, it's just not flowing properly. At Abbey Moor, second place Jimmy McRae reported few problems. The puncture, two punctures I actual fired towards the end of stages. It hasn't cost us a lot of time, but a few seconds. Uh, the car, they're just checking over. Other than that, no problems. But the good fortune wasn't to last. On the very next stage, McRae's Metro is misfiring and he drops out. A 
after five second place finishes on the Scottish, McRae misses out again and the bad luck hands a comfortable lead to Malcolm Wilson. Second place, Michael Sundstrom waiting to pounce in the Peugeot. Llewellyn third and on Drummond Hill, his Welsh nightmare of a tightening left came very much alive for Neil Duggan in the Nissan. And Neil Duggan's accident shows exactly why the sport has such great fears about spectator safety. You can watch rallying safely, but not on the outside of bends like that. It'll be a brave man, isn't it? It's somehow if if you get into the rhythm right at the start, it's such, you, you get all them right. Like, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of, I'm sure there'll be a couple of right unders where you come into a grassy section that Phil would tell you about. Yes. It's pretty flowing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few tightening on coming down that last bit, though, isn't there? There's a few left handers that are tightening just, around the, no, around the bit the there. there. Yeah. But of course, you couldn't go fast enough, don't you? <coughs> couldn't see. <laughs> <That's Yeah. right. laughs> but determination in the dust wasn't going to be enough for the Metro men. After the news filters through that Jimmy McRae has dropped out with his blown engine, there are strong indications of engine problems throughout the main Metro entry. Harry Toivonen, bravely returning to the sport after the death of his brother, also faces engine problems that were to end his rally. Austin Rover Motorsport boss John Davenport counts one back out onto the road, Malcolm Wilson, but David Llewellyn is needing a push start. car fires up eventually but it's been a disastrous few hours for the metros the strong suspicion being that it's either a component problem affecting the works cars or that the Scottish dust is fouling the engines There's the consolation of Malcolm Wilson leading the rally. Up near the head of the pack, there's little dust in the air, but the aerodynamics were possibly sucking the dust into the engine compartment. Sundstrom is second, but Llewellyn's third place wouldn't last long. His engine is becoming sicker, and soon he concedes third spot to Mark Lovell's Ford. quite clear that Llewellyn is about to become engine failure number five. So the leader Malcolm Wilson is the only one of the top line metros to make it to the Glasgow rest halt and Wilson is also showing signs of the engine plague that has struck down his colleagues. The decision is made to retire his car while the expiring engine is still intact and use it to discover the fault that has wiped out the Metro Challenge. The problem with the likes of David's engine and Jimmy's and Harry Toyman's is that those engines are actually destroyed um, completely and it's very difficult to diagnose a problem. Why has it all happened at once on this event? I don't know. It's just something in these, must be something in these four engines. Um, you know, we haven't had before. I mean, there's Tony's RAC engine, which is still running, believe it or not. You know, I think it's done 100 odd hours. It's incredible. I, I don't know the answer. I wish I did. <laughs> so what a change as the second leg started from Glasgow. Sundstrom really only challenged by Mark Lovell. His lead, three and a half minutes, but that's just the kind of winning position that Sundstrom threw away when he crashed out of the first round, the national breakdown. Michael, it's nice to see someone wearing overalls and ready for action this morning. You've got a good lead. How confident are you that this is the victory that you've been waiting for? <laughs> of course, it's 15 stages to go and everything can happen in rally. Uh, but um, I think this time I have um, possibility to drive uh, slow enough to not have any accidents. And uh, the car is 100%, so I think it will be a good run. How hard have you been going so far in the event? Let's say 100%, uh, not 110 and not 90. <laughs> 100%? Yes. 
and no problems at all? No problems at all, and um, what they said earlier on, the car has been 100%, no problem at all, and uh, uh, no mistakes, no, we have not went off, and so tyres work very well and everything will be fine. We've talked to you before a little bit about the pressure on you, which started in the first event, uh, the national breakdown. How aware are you of that now? Well, there was all, all, always a speak that it's the uh, last chance, and I think this is the fourth last chance this year, but uh, that uh, that not make a pressure on me. Certainly, Sundstrom didn't seem to be holding anything back as he fought to keep his advantage over Lovell. The British driver, who'd been going faster and faster since his poor start, was clipping away odd seconds. But he needed to increase the pressure enough to force a mistake. Well, the mistake did come, but not from Sundstrom. This is Lovell on a notorious corner in Twigley's Forest. Lovell's spectacular accident did little more than completely rearrange the RS200's bodywork, leaving the spectators to collect a few souvenirs. But it did cost him over two minutes in his battle to catch Sundstrom. At the service halt, the crew had it looking like a car again in no time. And Lovell's hopes of victory had pretty well completely disappeared. Mark, the end of the day, and it's all gone rather wrong. What happened on that twiggly stage? It hasn't gone wrong yet. We're still there. We're still in second. But um, we had a bit of a roll halfway through the stage. Fortunately, we there were some spectators there. Pushed us back on the wheels. We dropped about two minutes. What, what happened there? You just put a wheel over and... We just went a bit wide on a left-hander, and rather than being flat ground, there was a ditch. Once the wheel got in, we couldn't get back out, and it tipped over. Rolled up the bank. How hard were you trying there, and what sort of impression did you feel that you were making on Sundstrom? Well, we've, we've been trying pretty hard throughout the whole rally, but... Um, I guess that our luck was bound to end somewhere, so uh, we had to keep the pressure on Michael. It was gone off now, he's just got to get home. Sundstrom's victory journey home was through the traditional last day rain that the Scottish always suffers. Second place Lovell suffering no more dramas, but rumoured at this stage to be threatened with further time penalties. Third place, the Toyota of Bjorn Valdegard, always entertaining, but a one-off championship appearance. The sole surviving Metro, the private entry of David Gillanders, took fourth place. And fifth place for Russell Brooks in the Manta was enough to give him the championship lead in the absence of the leading Metros. Russell, it's hard to be happy early on a wet Tuesday morning, but you must be pretty satisfied with the weekend's work. Yes, uh, we didn't look forward to the Scottish Rally because there were so many four-wheel drive cars and it's loose surfaces, and we knew all we could do was try and capitalise on the reliability of the Opal Manta, and I think that's what we've done fairly successfully because uh, obviously there's a bit of confusion over Lovell's results at the moment, but whichever way that turns out, um, it looks like we're leading the championship. Safe to say it's been a very strange event, isn't it? Incredible. I mean, I, if you'd asked me before the event started, I would have said with it being shortened, um, it would have been a, a fairly unexciting rally, albeit start, uh, fast at the very start. But, uh, of course, we've had so many retirements, and they're happening even now, of course, uh, unfortunately for the Vauxhall team, both their uh, Group A Astra uh, and the Nova retired only two stages, from, three stages from the end. So uh, a rally absolutely full of dramas. What's the reason, do you think? I cannot explain it. Um, maybe because it's a shorter event, people drive that much faster and that much harder. Uh, and that's really the only ex explanation I can come up with. But here you are, top of the championship, with two tarmac rounds left, which must make you very optimistic about the final outcome. Um, well, it's difficult to be optimistic at this point, because obviously the scoring system is the best five count out of the six, and we've now scored on every round. Uh, and that means we're going to have to drop a score probably sometime or other. So um, a lot of calculations to do, but certainly I think uh, I'd rather be leading at this point than lying second or third.
In Glasgow, the pipes were no doubt meant to welcome Jimmy McRae's long-awaited Scottish victory. Instead, they were piping in Finland's Michael Sundström. A season of disappointment and sometimes despair for him so far, but now he'd scored his first major international victory in the Peugeot. good and we've got a softer compound tyre than we had in the circuit of Ireland so hopefully we'll be right. No problems with the engine this time? No, the engine's good. We, we did a, an event in the Canaries and uh, we had absolutely no problems at all so I hope that that's going to continue. McRae full of confidence in his new four-wheel drive MG Metro 6R4. And from his success in the Scottish Rally two months before, Finn Michael Sundstrom. And hoping for a win, Mark Lovell. Well, we've got to go hard right from the word go. So we should be trying to get right up on the pace straight away. Well, would you be hoping that David and Jimmy drop out and then... No, oh, I hope we beat them. I don't want anything to happen to them, but obviously it would make our life a lot easier if they did drop out. Yeah. So what's your main aim in this event then? To win it. So on its second appearance in Ireland, the Group B four-wheel drive Ford RS200, but right behind it was the powerful Metro of Welshman David Llewellyn. It is a very much a sprint event, so uh, just sort of bed ourselves into the first stage and see what the pace is like, really. Yeah, and just take it from there. Take it from there, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that the pace is going to be very, very quick. Uh, with the top five, all need to win this rally for chop, uh, championship wise, so um, it, it's going to be very, very quick. The teams lined up for the start of the special stages, starting west of the city and heading north to the coast. But what was on the minds of most of the competitors was how the new regulations imposed by the sports governing body FISA would affect the event. The special stages were restricted to no more than 75 miles an hour to try to avoid a repeat of recent accidents on international rallies. By the early stages, Russell Brooks was keeping his conventional rear-wheel drive Opel Manta in third place and clocking fastest time on some. And he kept up with the supercars too, beating the bogey time on almost every stage, so that by the ninth stage he was lying equal fourth. McRae too was falling foul of the change in regulations, sharing fastest time with the other leaders but he managed to break away so that by stage nine he was leading, if only by two seconds. Five seconds behind, Michael Sundström. Followed by Mark Lovell's Ford. David Llewellyn was going well, just two seconds behind McRae. Getting the most out of his Opel Manta, leading Irishman Austin McHale, competing for valuable points in the Irish Tarmac Championship. He gave a startling performance in spite of having recently left hospital after a kidney operation. Penty Auricola had problems right from the start with his gear selector, and these continued right through the event but he was still the fastest Group A car. The all-woman crew of Louise Aiken-Walker and Ellen Morgan started well staying in the top ten, and their good fortune was to continue throughout the event.
Andrew Wood had less luck, losing time to change a heater hose even before the start of the first stage in his Vauxhall Astra. Harry Toivonen was well amongst the leaders in the early stages and giving his customary surprising performance in the Skoda, John Hogland. Completing the lineup of Metro's, Cyril Bolton. Making the World International Rally debut of the new Ford Sierra RS Cosworth, Ken McKinstry. A short appearance though, he seriously damaged the car on stage 21. So, as the leaders battled it out together at the front of the field, the lower numbers fought to make their way there. But even away from the top international drivers, the later runners gave some impressive performances. How you run, Jim? Eh, uh, all right. Well, big problem with the new phase of ruling. They're out of the six stages we've done. We've cleaned five of them by about 60 or seconds. So, I mean, everybody's in the same position as they were after the first stage. The average speed is set at 75 miles an hour, and we've been breaking that five out of the six stages. So, you, uh, hypothetically, you've got four winners here? At the moment, there are uh, three of us leading. Uh, myself, David Llewellyn, and uh, Michael Sunstrom. <laughs> After six days. <laughs> David Llewellyn was also intrigued by the FISA ruling and how the winner would eventually be declared. <laughs> that is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Michael reckons that uh, if it's a tie at the end, that he'll win because he's got the smallest engine, but. Uh, I don't know if I totally agree with that. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have some stages soon that uh, that'll give us... Uh, sort all the problems out. Yeah, yeah, sort the job out. It's going to be pretty tight anyway, I think that's that's already been proved. Because like, even though you know we know what, what times we've been doing, mm -hmm. and we're all within a couple of seconds of each other anyway, so, so it's going to be close. If you hadn't been cleaning the stages, who would have been leading the rally just now? Uh, Jimmy, I think. Jimmy with us a couple of seconds behind him. Mm. And Michael about two seconds behind us, it was still been very close. So yeah. perhaps it isn't so unfair anyway, you know. 
Is it? Long way to go yet, though. Do I? Know. Yes. Yeah. So hopefully it'll, it'll sort itself out. <laughs> when the dark comes, everybody go a bit slower. Relaxing after his efforts, Penty Auricola was pleased with his progress after his earlier difficulties. You enjoying yourself? Yep. So how are you getting on? Oh, well, the first three stages we had some problems with um, gear selector. Maybe I've been playing tennis too much, so I was I tell the abusing the gear box. <laughs> so have. But um, the mechanics fixed it in the last service, in the last three stages, no problem at all. So I'm yeah, happy. Having to cope with a right-hand drive car, Harry Toivonen was looking forward to a left-hand drive Metro. I have driven all my life with the left-hand drive, and suddenly you must change. It's completely different. You know, you can't see the left side, where is it going, and you take too many shortcuts. <laughs> and so, sometimes there is, you know, some small stone, and that's always bad news. But uh, now I'm happy. I heard it in the morning that I will get... Uh, I knew that I will get left and right for a thousand legs, but I heard that uh, also for Manx. The final run to the finish back in Belfast and after a trouble-free event, Jimmy McRae was all set to win by more than a minute. Mark Lovell suffered from the usual gearbox problems which have plagued the car, but he still managed second place in spite of this being the first pace notes rally with his co-driver.
three minutes behind McRae, but still capturing third overall, Michael Sundstrom, delighted with his performance after an early setback. Russell Brooks finished fifth, slowed towards the end by oil in the clutch, but still a good result for a two-wheel drive car. After a season of retirements and coping with right-hand drive, Harry Toivonen in an excellent fourth place. And a spirited drive gave Austin McHill sixth place and maximum points in the STP Tarmac Championship. The ladies' prize went to Louise Aiken Walker and Ellen Morgan in their Nissan 240 RS after their seventh place. And repeating his success in the Circuit of Ireland, ninth overall for 19 year old Stephen Finlay. A series of problems failed to stop David Metcalf from winning Group A in his Vauxhall Astra GTE. On home territory, Robin Lyons took 12th place. While Pentia Ricola failed to recapture lost time early on and finished 13th overall and second in Group A. Heading to the finish, some of the drivers were still really flying, determined to get the best result possible. But Andrew Wood still had the gearbox problems which had troubled him all the way through and left him 25th overall. But the event belonged to the other Scotsman, Jimmy McRae. It wasn't the first time he'd won the event, but it was the first time he'd taken the Metro onto the finishing ramp. And no one was more pleased than he was. round of the Open Championship, the sun-drenched Isle of Man, recovering from TTs and bike Grand Prix, prepared itself for another high-speed assault. High-speed tarmac and the introduction of chicanes only fractionally slowing down the cars. This is Pentia Ricola in the Astra GTE leading the championship Group A. The drivers especially reliant on co-drivers as this is a pace note rally. And Ronan McNamee explains exactly what that means. It means that a few weeks before each event, we or sometimes the weekend before, we go over the course and Penty and I do a low, low speed reconnaissance of the course and he calls to me each bend and corner and jump and I write that down in, in my form of shorthand. So this is your form of shorthand, Ronan, what's it all about? Okay, so if we look at the start, this is stage number six and on the top left hand corner we have 50, which is the distance and then we have right four, which is a right hand bend, which is reasonably severe, followed suddenly by a left five narrow, caution, a bridge and 50 meters chicane seven one of these famous chicanes we've graded those in, in numbers as well um 600 then is a distance left six short quite a severe bend 200 another chicane and 
where you see something like right five break into left six long underlined, that means I've got to read that together. 50, right four, suddenly left five narrow, caution bridge. 50, kick in seven. that form of shorthand why numbers are not descriptive terms i think it's a dumb driver like me he understands that five is a bigger number than one say for example i think it is uh, but really it is a question about that uh, it's, uh, the numbers are very short words like one two three and so on and they are quite different from each other so it's easier in the noise rally car to hear and that to understand it there's no point to have a bass nose if you don't understand it uh, or you don't uh, if he's not quick enough to read them so the number system i'm sure is the one which is in the future everybody is going to use tony pond local isle of man resident world championship star leads the event away from douglas promenade pond three times winner of the manx and with his knowledge of the event he'd been employed in citing the straw bale chicanes that were needed to bring the average speeds down to fisa requirements and Pond, making his only championship appearance of the season, thought that he was going pretty quick on the first stage. But then Pond discovered that he was three seconds slower than the Metro of Jimmy McRae, the winner in Ulster, already right on course for the Open title. But there was no doubt that championship leader Mark Lovell was also trying hard in the Ford RS200. champion Russell Brooks, Manx winner last year, for him only a distant hope of repeating that double in the two-wheel drive Manta with its massive power disadvantage. And a rare glimpse nowadays of an Audi Quattro. This is West German Harold de Muth in the David Sutton engine car. It met an early demise. And the man they call Mickey Finn, Michael Sundstrom, Scottish winner in the Peugeot. Then there was David Llewellyn, all those well-recorded calamities of the earlier rounds put to the back of his mind as the Circuit of Ireland winner went for a good finish on the Isle of Man. The Skoda of John Horglund going for what's become a customary class win. This year, though, wasn't to be. The initial exchanges confirmed that this was to be a Metro rally. Early pace setter Jimmy McRae with Ian Grindrod reading the pace notes. Keeping up the pressure, Mark Lovell in the Ford RS200. Already for him, though, early signs of problems with the car cutting out briefly on the left-hand bends. Llewellyn also struggling with handling problems. The Welshman lying four. But sweeping into the lead after being beaten on the first stage, the Metro of Tony Pond and co-driver Rob Arthur. Michael Sundstrom handling problems for him in the Peugeot. The early high-speed action was taking an unusual toll on the Group B cars. The problem here for Russell Brooks, apart from lack of horsepower and four-wheel drive, was a bad attack of flu. The defending champion battled on. Towards the end of day one, Pond leads. Jimmy McRae second and content to let Pond disappear as long as Mark Lovell stayed behind him. The priority was the championship. Over two minutes behind McRae's teammate David Llewellyn. And then came Sundstrom having clipped a corner after a spin on one stage. And fifth was Lovell, his championship hopes only faintly alive after problems that continued 
right to the end of the day. Leaving service after the last stage, the um, gearbox jammed in first gear just as we were pulling out. So we had to stop and make another gearbox, well, make a gearbox change. So uh, we got to within the, the maximum time by one minute. So we're just going, but we've lost two minutes 20. Not Lovell's day, but even second place McRae wasn't especially happy. We have a gearbox problem. The, an oil seal has gone in the box and it's blown all the oil out. Uh, we're going to change the box now, but the vans have been held up in a traffic jam further back the road, so we're hoping that we'll get in any minute. Mind you, everyone was doing that. Day two and Ponds Metro continues untroubled. <laughs> Times Open Championship winner Jimmy McRae in second place, setting out on what was to be a fateful day in his attempt to make it title number four. All fine here, but one of those small stones bouncing off the tarmac would find its way into the engine, and that was the disappointment in store for McRae. But Llewellyn was still efficiently protecting his Metro teammate, Llewellyn still lying third. little Michael Sundstrom in the Peugeot could do to break into the Metro 123. <laughs> Hardest trier on the second day, Mark Lovell attempting everything in the Ford RS200 to close the gap on his championship rival McRae. For Brooks, he was working more efficiently, he'd shaken off the flu, but there was no more he could get out of the Manta. His reign as Open champion seemed to be coming to an end. <laughs> Meanwhile, another title had just been bestowed. Auricula and McNamee, with a camera aboard the Astra GTE, were confirmed as Group A champions after the demise of Dave Metcalf. But there was still plenty of work to be done. Short. 150. Jump left two minus. Into right three. Into left two. And jump left two minus. Break and right six. Then the news of McRae's blown engine, signified by Pond going through in the lead, with Llewellyn now second. And in third, it's Mark Lovell, now with the major obstacle removed in his challenge for the title. Dropping out of fourth, Michael Sundstrom, the Peugeot suspension rearranged after another spin. And new hope for Russell Brooks. Maybe it's still possible to hang on to that open title. He's clearly got new inspiration. But at the end of day two, clear championship favourite is Lovell. 24 hours on and a complete change in fortune. We've had a bit of luck today and um, bad, bad luck's fallen on other people. So. How did you hear the, the news about Jimmy and what was your immediate reaction without uh, putting too big a smile on your face? It's very difficult to sum it up quickly. We didn't hear it, we saw it, we saw him pat on the side of the stage. And um, I said to Roger, I said, oh, God, I'm so, there's Jimmy parked up there. And it sort of went to pieces for a couple of miles, not just knowing what to do. But um, he, Roger just said he's back, and um, all we've got to do now is get home. Third will be OK. It's only pretty straightforward day for you, but uh, I think you've just heard the news about Jimmy. What are your feelings in that direction? Well, I'm very, very, very sorry for him because I, he was driving extremely well, and I thought the championship looked like it was going his way. But this, this is this business. You can be doing so well, and then it's all finished. The chance of the fourth title gone for him, but the chance of the fourth victory here on the island still very much alive for you and looking really completely in your grasp at this stage. Yes, well, as his championship looked for him, you know, you can never say it until you drive over the finishing ramp and it's all signed and sealed. In this sport, everything is stretched to the limit, drivers, cars, tyres, everything, and you only want one mistake or one problem and it's all over, so. But at the moment, the car performing absolutely 100%. Yeah, the car's great and we're able to back off 
fair bit so we can extend the life of everything and hopefully shouldn't be any problems. OK, but you're not going to relax yet? <laughs> no, not relaxing. No. One loss of concentration in these powerful cars could spell disaster, and although he was under no real pressure, Leader Pond was in for a tense final day. Second place Llewellyn's aim was to be just as composed, protecting Pond's position and ensuring a Metro 1-2. As for Mark Lovell and co-driver Roger Freeman, all the permutations seemed to point to them winning the title. A third place finish, though, would make absolutely sure. Russell Brooks's hopes lay with a Lovell retirement, followed by the defending champion somehow forcing the Manta up to second. by Sundstrom for fourth place and if the Peugeot got past it would all be over. Final stages and the last open championship appearance of the powerful Group B supercars due to be outlawed at the end of the season. The Metro 6R4 and the man winning the Max for the fourth time, Tony Pond. Second place, David Llewellyn, who over the course of the season has learned precisely how dangerous these cars can be in a series of high-speed accidents. Third place, and the open title to Mark Lovell. No rally wins this season, but consistent finishing points in every round. Michael Sundstrom claiming that fourth place and using every inch of the road in the World Championship winning 205 Turbo 16. Defending champions Russell Brooks and Mike Broad, who performed so magnificently to keep the Manta up with its more powerful challengers right till the end of the season. It's Group A next year, although they won't look quite like Brian Wiggins' Astra GTE that won Group A on the Isle of Man when Auricola went out with a fuel problem. The 1986 Manx overcame the problems of the late FISA rule changes and as usual, the sun shone to confirm the event's status as one of the major European rallies on one of the smallest islands. And the efficient organization and quality of entry confirmed its ranking as a coefficient four event in Europe. It was double honours then at the finish back in Douglas. Tony Pond was in the winner's role with the champagne and he chose the occasion to announce his retirement from rallying later this year. But in the background was a jubilant Mark Lovell taking the Open Championship title for the very first time. Thank you. 
flying down here on the left of the rise. As you welcome the 1986 new British Super Champion in the Ford RS2 Andros.